Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry for me changing to English now. Uh, my French is just so bad. <laughs> I had it in school, uh, and I think when I stopped school, uh, my French was at least as good as my English, but I did not practice for a long time, so I'm not so young anymore. Anyhow, um, I, as I said, will talk here in English, but I think uh, in the Q&A, uh, we are open to ask in French. Maybe I can understand, otherwise, uh, Carsten will assist me. So. The talk, the presentation I want to give you today has the title, as you see, Towards a Digital Society on Demetalization of the Social World. I want to start this presentation just by taking one example, and very often you can shorten a whole talk to one example, and this is the example I have here. So I'm quite sure you don't know what this image is represents. It represents uh, what is called Anikti Wei, Wei, however you want to pronounce it. It is, as it was just written by one of the person who developed this kind of machine, the first German language editorial column by an artificial intelligence. So it started last year at a German newspaper, Tageszeitung, which is originally quite left-wing, critical, uh, critical um, sorry, critical newspaper with origins in um, the countercultural movements of the 70s. The point or the reason why I took this example, and this is represented by the quotes from this article by Fischer, who was within the team developing this artificial intelligence, is to argue for one thing. While we at the present, and if you look at the public discourse, as far as I'm informed, also in France, think that these are really machines who do something with us, who even might have a kind of intelligence. Sometime in the future, something different happens from my point of view. Yes, these are machines built for communication, but none of these machines act on its own. The point about these machines is that they are really deeply entangled with human practices from the beginning. And this is the only point why these machines are able to communicate. So therefore, to put it another way, I think we should contextualize the present discussion about what is called communicative AI, so AI made for communication, in a much broader perspective. And this is the perspective how these technologies relate to the way how we construct our social world. And this is basically what I link with the term mediatization or deep mediatization. More in a nutshell, I want to present here today in the next 30 minutes three theses on the digital society and emerging automation of communication. The first thesis is that no society ever will become digital. It's just a metaphor. What, I, what, we, are, what we are witnessing is something else, and this is what we might call the deep mediatization of the social world. My second thesis is now more concrete to communicative AI. Communicative AI is not a phenomenon of a human interacting with a machine. It is a phenomenon of societal communication. And only if you understand it by that, we can grasp what's going on. And the third thesis is that we in media and communication research should move from a research focusing on consequences of media and media technologies to one of their emergence. Because only then we can participate in a social discourse how these technologies might or should be. So let's start with the first thesis. No society becomes ever digital. What we are witnessing is a deep mediatization of our social world. To argue here, I want to start with two quotes from people who put emphasis on the term of the digital society. The first one, she comes more from the English-speaking world. It's Lupton, she's an Australian scholar, wrote already 2015 a book with the title Digital Sociology. And within, this, within that book, she ongoingly also uses the term digital society. But something very interesting you can become aware. 
when you read these different sections within the book when she reflects on the digital society. And this is that there is no real definition of digital society at all. As you can see here in the quote, it is just a metaphor for society where the digital media are present. That's it. However, there are also other scholars who have a deeper concept of digital society. Again, one quote for this group of scholars. It's now from a German scholar, sociologist. His name is Nasehi. And he wrote uh, three years ago a book with the title Muster in German. In English, it would be Pattern, where he argues for a theory of digital society. The core argument within that book is to say that with what he calls digital society, we are in a new stage of development of societies, a third discovery of society, how I called it. A moment of time when society becomes very much differently represented to us. So the observer observation of us as human beings living within a society changes with digital media and technologies because new kinds of patterns become represented. Patterns where we haven't been aware of. I think this is a much stronger argument he makes. But on the other hand, I even would say also in that case, it's not really about a digital society. A society itself never becomes digital. We might use digital media for observation within the society. Our practices change within society when we use digital media and technologies. However, it remains the human practices which make society meaningful and by that construct society. Therefore, I would like to position other ideas or other kind of thinking against these arguments about a digital society. And this is a thinking which we relate to the term mediatization or more concrete, demediatization. So in general, mediatization, at least in the German-speaking, English-speaking world, established over the last years as a concept, as a thinking, as a discourse to reflect on how the changing practices or of changing, uh, sorry, changing uh, media and communications relate to, on the other hand, uh, the change of cultures and societies. If you go more specific into this term, we can argue that demediatization is an advanced stage of mediatization in which the foundations of our social world are constitutively interwoven, entangled with digital media and their infrastructures. So what I mean by this is that many, many things which make up society could not exist in the form as they exist nowadays without this digital media and infrastructure. So just think about the financial market. The financial market as we know it would not exist anymore without these technologies. It would be another kind of market, another kind of financial market. But what makes it specific is exactly this entanglement with these technologies. Only by this, many, many of the so-called products of the financial market can exist. If you start a perspective like this, we end up, as I would like to argue, by in all a number of overreaching trends. So what I want to say by that is not a criticism of political economy, arguing, for example, that state agencies and companies are responsible or take their responsibilities or are influential on these developments. The point I would like to make is that over all these different agencies or cooperative actors, we have these far-reaching trends. The first trend, I would say, is differentiation. So in the beginning of digitalization, we had the idea that everything would merge, would converge into one big supercomputer, super machine. This did not happen. We have a variety of different devices nowadays, but all of them are digital and used for communication. So just have a look here at this lecture hall, the different devices you have. Think about your home, think about your car, and so on and so on. All the things became digital devices, used or at least partly used for communications. The second trend is the trend of, in, uh, of an increasing connectivity, which means that all these devices are increasingly connected with each other for communication, but also for other kinds of purposes.
With mobile communication, we are living now at least in many parts of the global north in a situation of an increasing omnipresence. It's hardly to imagine situations where some kind of digital media does not play a role. Even when we have a walk just to talk with a friend, we have our mobiles in the pocket, and when we come to a point that we don't understand something, we check. The last, or the, sorry, uh, the next trend is the trend of an increasing path of innovation. So this means that the cycles of innovation became faster and faster over the last decades. If you think about your computers, if you think about your mobile phones, only three or four years after you bought them, well, you are in the risk that you cannot use them anymore, at least if you want to have the latest applications running on them. How deep these innovations go, this is not a kind of question, but we have this process of increasing. And finally, there's datafication. Datafication just means at that point that while all these different media are digital and based on software, they ongoingly produce data. And this changed the whole construction of our, of our social world. So basically what we have now is a media environment with a media manifold. So with a variety of different media and only if we focus on this environment in that way we can grasp what's going on. We could now zoom deep into questions of deep mediatization. So this is how to theorize, how to reflect on that. Of course, these trends are human made. And of course, one has to reflect these trends, not from the perspective of effects, but from the perspective how we change our sense making within the different figurations we are involved in as human beings. I cannot discuss this whole change here, but the point I want to make is that through these trends, we have an ongoing refiguration of society and this reconfiguration in relation to deep mediatization means the emergence new of new interrelations between the different figurations of humans we are involved in, the emergence of new figurations, so for example figurations which are somehow collected around platforms and the transformation of existing figuration. Think about how the figuration of a newsroom changes when certain kinds of technologies become part of them. Somehow the underlying topic of my talk today is now this emergence of these new kinds of figurations and we can understand this example I started with as an example for exactly that. So nothing came from outside. What happened was that a newsroom had the idea, wow, it might be great to have a German language editorial column by artificial intelligence. It might make fun. Yeah? And it only came up because already the programming of this system was deeply interwoven with journalistic practices. If you would like or if you would read that article by Fischer, one of the points is it was hard to come to a point that a machine like this is able to produce really a whole column. It was not an easy going. So it was human work to bring this machine to the point and up to now it's human work to have, let's say, somehow fun with this machine. Therefore, what does it then mean that we as humans are able to communicate with automated systems? Here I would like to argue that we must be careful somehow with the term communication itself. So if you think about the human as an actor, it is quite obvious what communication is. It is a kind of human practice. But when we think about a machine, it becomes much more complicated. It's an automated system and what you get from this automated system is cognitive feedback. And where does this feedback base on? It's based on? Well, on our communications. So all the data, chat, GPT and other kind of large language models are based on. These are just the traces of the communication we as humankind produced have produced. With all the problems of our communication, with all the biases, with all the points where communication might become problematic. And this is the reason why also the systems have the problems we have as humans with our communications. So basically they don't act the way we as humans act. What we get from them is a kind of cognitive feedback, which nevertheless changes the way 
how we construct society, so is part of this refiguration of society. Exactly this brings me to my second thesis. Communicative AI is a phenomenon of societal communication. So if you look at newspapers nowadays, very often they are telling the story about ChatGPT as a story of one human interacting with one kind of machine. So that's the narration which is produced to us. From my point of view, this is a quite limited narration to understand what's going on. We must understand these systems in this much broader perspective of mediatization. At this point, uh, I'm referring back to some collective work we have done at SAMKI, where we recently published one paper on these systems, which is out in Germany, already an English version of that, uh, will be out in the next two or three weeks. Where we reflect on this hype about these different systems and the term, the concept of communicative AI. So AI, artificial intelligence, which is made for the purpose of communication. Starting such a kind of reflection, uh, well, the first step is always to define what communicative AI is or might be. And what we suggest in that paper is a definition based on three criteria. First of all, this AI is based on various forms of automation whose purpose is communication. So it is really about communication. It's not about intelligence. It is about communication. That's the point. Second, they are comprehensively embedded within digital infrastructures. So think about what I just said about ChatGPT. ChatGPT would not or could not exist without the infrastructure of the internet. Without all the digital traces we have produced for decades now. This is what makes these systems possible. And finally, they are intimately entangled with human practices. So they never ever do anything on their own. They do things when we let them do things. Yeah. Think about an example of this automated column I was talking about. So this only works if a user makes a decision to let it work. And it's hard work to make the systems communicate. It's something which is very often forgotten, especially within all this hype about cognitive AI. In this sense, we understand cognitive AI as a sensitizing concept, to use here now a term by Bloomer from his classical article in the 50s uh, about social theory, where he argued that we have two kinds of concepts. One kind is sensitizing concepts, so concepts which make us sensible for things that are changing. The other things are definitive concepts, so concepts which we can operationalize in empirical research. We understand cognitive AI as a sensitizing concept. Therefore, what does it sensitize us for? There are two things uh, we argue, com AI, sensitize us for. So the first thing is the breadth of the phenomenon. So now we are maybe having the feeling that automated communication is just the thing about chat GPT if we follow the, op uh, the, the social discourse. But it's a really, really, really broad phenomenon, including artificial companions, chatbots, news bots, social bots, work bots, and many, many more systems. So it is basically about the automation of communication and not just one system. The point here is that a good number of the systems and also ChatGPT are not domain specific. They are thought to work across different domains. They are thought as technologies that you can use them, for example, for a chatbot, but also for a news bot or work bot in the work environment. Furthermore, we argue that it sensitizes us for the depth of the phenomenon. So automation of communication is not just about human-machine interaction, but about a transformation of societal communication as a whole, as automated systems become part of it. And this is exactly now the point I want to follow a bit. Taking here OpenAI and ChatGPT as an example. Some background of this is uh, my own. 
uh, media ethnographic studies. So just when Corona came, I was in San Francisco working or researching on different kinds of pioneer communities or so tech communities which bring the development forward. And I had to the idea, well, to go to this building. Does anybody know what kind of building this is? Never thought? Okay, it's in, it's in the Mission District in San Francisco. Uh, it's not such a large building. This is the building, this is the so-called Pioneer Building, a historical building, and this is the building where OpenAI still is, together with other companies. So we have the feeling that OpenAI is, wow, bigger than everything. OpenAI as an organization, as an institution, is not so big. And the money they are taking, well, this is money which they basically need for training their language models, for technological investment. That's the point. It's not about paying all the humans, at least, within that building. When I was doing this field research, nobody talked about open AI. So it was more an insider thing, which I knew from my research in this pioneering communities. I had to stop this research because Corona came. I had to take really one of the last planes back to Europe before the border were closed. Um, this is how the research ended, at least partly. So, well, two years later, I continued. But of course, you know, something else happened. And this is what you can represent here by this Google Trends. This is just, well, the Google data on the searches about OpenAI and ChatGPT starting the 11th of December. And what happened at the 11th of December? Well, OpenAI started its new big marketing campaign. And we are all part of it by talking ongoingly about Jet GPT. So nothing big happened, but a company started to market the next version of their system. Therefore, we are much more part of in something which we might call, at least this is how one of my colleagues and his team, Christian Katzenbach, said it, a talking into being. So we are all part of talking AI or cognitive AI into being. Only by cognitively constructing new media technologies as the next crucial innovation, the resources can be moved to potentially bring them into existence. So this is one particular pattern you all might know from so-called Silicon Valley. They need billions of investments to make these technologies possible. And, well, cognitive AI, it's just the next thing. The next thing after, for example, Facebook had problems with the so-called metaverse, you know about a big layoff, after the crash of many fantasies about blockchain. So it was about an next big story. And the next big story is, well, cognitive AI. And even we as academics are part of constructing it in this way. But also if we should zoom in to, well, bots, we could say that bots are not so much about the interaction with the human. So this is just now some statistical data saying that most of the bots here, based on the analysis of bon one bot network, have the function to influence online communication, for example, even journalists, what they think might be rising topics. They are only very, very, in very, very few cases functioning for the interaction with the human. So it's about a whole societal communication, the whole societal communication in which AI is constructed as the next thing, or bots are or should or might influence. Therefore, the point here when it comes to the thesis is that comic AI as a is a phenomenon of societal communication, and they cannot adequately understand the emergence of cognitive AI and its role in the construction of reality, if you do not see it as part of this. We can relate this to three core arguments. One thing is that even if we say that these systems are intelligent, this is part of societal construction. We can say that making these systems possible 
is embedded in what we might call a talking into being. And finally, these systems are not just about the interaction with one human, they are about really long chains of communication. So therefore, I would like to come to my third thesis. We should move from a media research of consequences to one of emergence. This is a thesis where it's a point I'm now thinking about for about two years. Of course, I know all the tradition of media and communication research. And this is a tradition on looking on the consequences, at the effects, at the influences, and whatever. The point I want to make is that this is a very, very tricky thing, having only this perspective. It is a tricky thing because it's a thing of fashion. So in the beginning, think back about the Arab Spring. The main argument was even in academia that to say that, well, all these media technologies, Twitter, whatever, they would support democracy. Well, some years later, we would be careful about that. Our fashion nowadays, it's more that. They are bad. <laughs> And this is a fashion of publication. So if you look 10 years back, we had a tendency of papers, of books, whatever, telling this story. Now it's just the other story around. So our ideas of what the influence might be, it has a lot to do with societal discourse itself. How society, let's say, feels with these technologies. And very often we do not reflect it. Because this is even where the funding goes. In the light of this horizon, um, my point here is to say that we should possibly, at least in part, should change our thinking about why and what kind of research we are doing. Of course it is important to have some research on influences, consequences. But if we really want to participate in the societal discourse, how these technologies should be shaped, should be designed, or to use a German word, how the Gestaltung of these technologies should be, then it's just too late if we start a conversation when everything happened. Now, linking this back to communicative AI, we can notice that communicative AI is nothing new. So, for example, here now to really refer to Licklider from the 60s, one of the figures who thought about these technologies very often and pushed development in that direction. He already argued that it's not about intelligence or something. He had the metaphor of human-machine symbiosis, so bringing machines very close to the human and by this being able to do great things. So basically this is the idea for Google Translate. Google Translate does not translate. It's just statistical, uh, statistical calculation, but with a very terrific human-machine symbiosis. Or, to take another historical example from the Institute of the Future, which was closely related with American politics, and where we have one kind of method from the so-called Delphi study. So this idea that we might predict the future by, first of all, doing interviews with experts in different fields, and then second, asking the experts by, well, or asking these experts uh, about the expectation when these changes, the first, uh, first interviews told, might come. So they did do very early on uh, one of the biggest up to now uh, Delphi studies when it comes to technologies. Sorry now for using that uh, German picture from it. It is just published more nicely in German than uh, the typed report, the typed original report. The point I want to make here is only this column, symbiosis between human and machine. So already in the 60s it was said it would be happen sometime between, well, starting 2010, ending 2020, something like that. Uh, by the way, large supervision would never ever happen. This expert thought, well, they were wrong. <laughs> we know that it happened. The point I want to make here is just to say, again this, it's part of a talking into being. When the biggest experts of the world are saying this will come, there are many arguments to invest resources into this direction, and by this increase the chances that this might and here we are exactly to one research field I'm very much interested in, and this is 
the pioneer community. So all these groups in the Bay Area which push this thinking. I only want to give you some insights into one of these groups, the Hacks Hackers. So this is one of the groups with the origins uh, in the Bay Area, spreading down now around the world. They had even a chapter in different cities in France, and curating these conversations by, for example, a newsletter. The point I want to make here is that if you focus on groups like this, you begin to understand that a conversation or the idea that AI is the next big thing in communication started much earlier than we might expect. So, having a focus on the newsletter of them, you could say already 20, started 2017, 2018, a discourse began. Framing it exactly at the thing what happened. And of course, these new letter, newsletters are read especially by the people engaged in that field. And they had again the feeling of, well, they should not miss it out, because if you miss it out, then it might become a problem. Therefore, we can say, or focusing on pioneer communities like this, we can say that many, many of the technological developments we are having now, they just did not come. If we would have a much more careful lens on it, we might have seen them coming. And if you might see them coming and you are doing research on these processes of emergence, you can participate in critical reflection about that. And my big hope is, when it comes to cognitive AI, that more and more scholars exactly will do this. And I'm quite optimistic it started. Therefore, just to conclude with my last thesis and with my talk. How can a research on the emergence of media and technology might look at? Well, I have no final answer on this, and I would be very happy to start a conversation with you about that topic. However, I think there are some points we should have in mind. The first point is that we should make what is called possible futures again the subject of empirical research. So it was a subject of research in the 70s, 80s, then it was basically forgotten. And I think it's really a crucial point to talk about the imaginaries of the future in relation to media and technologies in a much deeper way. Because these imaginaries give an orientation to developments. The second point is we also should focus on different kinds of groups, which media and communications was for a long time not so much aware of. So pioneer communities, development labs, and other groups that push developments should become much more a focus of media and communications research than they are now. Furthermore, I think we should take this talking into being and the proclaiming constitution seriously. So if people are saying that things will be the future, they construct a future, partly for us. And this happens now with all the guys writing letters about, well, how AI would shape the world. Basically, these are in good parts fantasies, but fantasies which shape the future, which have influence on that. It's a talking into being. And we should discover new kinds of methods. So one thing I'm at least... Uh, I'm thinking of is what we call agile qualitative experiments. So in experimental research in the beginning, there were two traditions, so-called qualitative experiments and standardized experiments. The qualitative experiments are mainly forgotten. So what is done is standardized experiments which come more from media psychology. In the beginning was the idea also to start projects in real life as a kind of test and figure it out what happens then. So we in Bremen have done this on our own with a no local news app, which is now hopefully starting in a few years nationwide. And we learned a lot about that by developing about the own platform. What is wrong, for example, in the things Google and other companies are telling. So other things are possible. And this is what you only can learn with this kind of experiment. As I said, you might have a lot of other kinds of ideas. I would be happy to start a conversation about that. The point I really want to make here, and by this conclude my presentation, is to say we should focus on the emergence of technologies and not only research them, 
when things happened, at least as long as we want to get influence on how our deeply mediatized societies are. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Andreas, pour ce large vol à travers ce fascinant sujet et cette thématique. Je me tourne vers les organisateurs et je demande combien de temps pourrons-nous consacrer Une dizaine de minutes 15 minutes, nous dit, de haut de, du ciel, Patrice. Bien, est-ce qu'on a un deuxième micro, en fait, pour les questions Ils sont Pardon Un, deux, trois. Ouais. Maybe I can just start with asking one question and then I can pass over the, the Posé en anglais, en français, il n'y a pas de souci, on traduit, on se, on se débrouille. Yeah, so I have just a, a short question about the role of technology in, in the process. So uh, thank you very much for this talk. It's really very interesting and um, enlightening for us. Um, and I really like the idea about the emergence, about the process, not, not the, the, the result. Um, so if I resume correctly your talk, artificial intelligence is a process of human practices and uh, a social communication that acts on the world and deeply transforms it. So in, in your vision of, uh, uh, of artificial intelligence, so technology, th so that's my question, are technology are equal to the humans or a little more uh, subordinated by the humans? Because you said that uh, people are communicating and technology are rather uh, sending a feedback. So in your conception of, of this agencement, let's say in, in French or entanglement in English, what is the role exactly of the, of the technology? Are they equal to humans? Because let's say we are here in society, so we are living in society with the social artifacts. But I think about the creation of the world. If we read a, just one book of Stephen Hawking, the human beings have been created by the object som somewhere in the, uh, in the cosmology, so coming from somewhere. So I think we sometimes forgot that humans are not just the master of the world, but also technology and the artifacts and the material world also act as an equal agent in the interaction. What's your point of view on that? Well, I try to make it short. We could have a long philosophical debate about that, but taking your first point you made, I don't think that machines are equal to humans because if it would be the case, we wouldn't build machines. We could just have more humans. So we make up machines because they are different and because we have the imagination for example to delegate work to them yeah? to say okay it's better to have a machine doing this for me or for us because it's more convenient for us as human beings therefore of course uh, machines make something to the construction of the social world but what machines do not do is constructing meaning and I think that's for me the crucial line between talking about a machine on the one hand and talking about a human on the other hand. Yeah. And of course, overall, uh, the ways we as humans live change with, let's say, also automation of communication. Yeah. We already know this. Yeah. It is at some points a risk of the jobs. Might we lose some jobs? Might we win some jobs? For sure, we will change the way we are working. Yeah. So it's a process of transformation, I would say. Yeah. And I understand Technology is always as entangled with human practices and not as separate from human practices. And this is for me really the, the mistake which is very often done within research. So if you're talking about on the one side a machine and on the other side a human, you forgot an entanglement. So here chat GPT, here the human. Well, chat GPT is deeply embedded in human practices. So there the human and there all the digital traces from other humans. So this is, from my point of view, the story we should take. And this is, a f I would say, a perspective 
I would prefer uh, to take as a basis to reflect on media technologies in general, because by that we can very clearly ask the question, what kinds of, in this sense, processes of automation of communication do we want to have for what purpose? So I think there are a lot of purposes which are fine, but on the other hand, something I completely dropped here now uh, because of time are all the environmental questions. So all these technologies have extremely high costs for the environment. And should we use them just for having a funny postcard? We might talk about that. Thank you, Andres. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Yes, I'm actually going Thanks for this interesting uh, conference. I have a question more critical and maybe more open. Uh, do you think it's possible and maybe necessary to stop following the platform's innovations, often adopting their language and agendas, and maybe do their, re their public relations sometimes, <laughs> and instead develop an approach that breaks away from the reason they impose and does uh, focusing on emergence is enough or maybe rethinking our manner to do researches on platforms. Good. Well, I think uh, to give you an answer on that question, maybe the point I like to make is, um, or think about is, what is innovation? Yeah? So I'm coming from a background of process sociology, so guys like Norbert Elias and whatever, and this is the thinking of understanding anything as a process, as an ongoing process. So it's not a point to say that tomorrow is different from today and that we will have tomorrow different technologies than today. This is how life goes. Yeah? The point is when are technologies communicatively constructed as innovation? That's the point. Yeah? When is it said that, that it would disrupt society? Then that's the point. And this is first of all, from my perspective, a narration. So we had, when it comes, for example, to platforms, we had a narration that the platforms would change everything. Did they change so much? Well, think about Airbnb, think about Uber, and think about platforms like that. They produced, let's say, bullshit shops. Europe, Europe acted against with regulations. Many cities acted against with regulations. So I would be very careful with any ideas of disruption. And so for me, it is really about a multi-level analysis. On the one hand, analyzing critically the discourses about what technologies would do. At the same time, having a careful analysis of what technologies can do in specific and particular kinds of figurations. And then you are much more cautious. What can you do with ChatGPT? So I have a funny exercise I'm doing once a week. I ask ChatGPT, who am I? It's funny. You can try it. <laughs> so I'm ongoingly, so where I'm working, this is the only continued thing. The place where I'm born differs, when I'm born. Sometimes it does not find me uh, and says, well, I'm sorry, you're not existing in my data, and so on and so on. So this is a particular kind of context. And in many contexts, ChatGPT uh, differs very much from the narration which we have in public about what ChatGPT would do, might do, or should do in the future. And interrelating this opens up perspectives on the development. Furthermore, I'm personally really interested in the tech communities, but this would be a fully other kind of story. Yeah. Uh, hi. So I'm going to stand up so, so you can see who's talking. Thank you for that refreshing take on, on mediatization. Uh, I'm just curious. I'm sure when I read the book, I'll get my answer anyways, but uh, just uh, offhand. When you were uh, talking, when you were presenting the theory of, of deep mediatization, and you mentioned how Lupton uses the word digital society as a metaphor, I expected immediately that you, you'd mention Castell and say, so his idea of the network society is another, another metaphor. And I was just wondering, uh, how do you position your work and yourself vis-a-vis -vis Castell's work? And so Manuel Castell's obviously, and his theory of the network society, mm -hmm. and whether it figures at all in the book and in what sense. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, Castell's, well, I, I was sometime a fan of him, <laughs> sometime. Uh, but what I think my, my 
point with his work is that he, I really even would say misunderstood what network is. So network, it's an academic term basically, at least in social sciences, to describe human relations, so flat human relations, and that's it. And I would argue you cannot understand a society uh, based on a network thinking because a society is not flat, a society is always hierarchical. Uh, and this is where Castells has a lot of problems. Uh, for me, I then made a journey back to Norbert Elias and his idea of figurations. There you have the network of thinking as part of, so saying uh, that each figuration has an actor constellation, which you can understand as a network. But at the same, same time saying each figuration is somehow limited in the sense of how we as humans have an orientation within the figuration. So if you are within the figuration of your family, well, you act differently and you know exactly where family ends compared to the figuration of your friends, compared to the figuration of your workmates, and so on and so on. And furthermore, Elias develops really an idea, or at least the basis for an idea, how to interrelate figurations and think a whole society from that perspective. From my point of view, Castells never ever offered this. Uh, I think he was an important figure in that moment of time. But if you read from today's perspective his writings from the 90s, well, I would say it's not my world he's describing. And this is the point where I would say, for me at least, uh, he falls short. Nevertheless, I have to admit, I was for a certain time a uh, sorry, uh, Castells fan wrote reviews about his work, read everything, and so on and so on. So, of course, it inspired, yeah? but I think it has its limits. Uh, thank you very, very much for this uh, inspiring presentation. And if you could just switch back to the last uh, slide. Uh, I was uh, wondering, uh, with your demonstration, as uh, a question, how can the emergence of media and technology be researched? Uh, I, I think if I heard you well, that uh, it would imply to reflect upon the role of research itself. Uh, because uh, you showed that uh, uh, talking into being is also uh, uh, something that researchers do. And uh, I was wondering, the second point, focus pioneer communities. Uh, maybe it would imply work with uh, pioneer communities and maybe uh, research would have the role of equip them uh, with new kind of questions or knowledge. And yes, I was wondering what your thought was. Well okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for asking. So this section on pioneer communities and these points that was when I had to change to a fast forward mode during my presentation, uh, just to keep the, pa the time. Well, um, how can I answer this this, this quickly? Uh, I think when it comes to the role of researchers. Um, over the years, I become much more self-reflexive on that point. Just to take now an example, all these systems of automated communication, they are based on research which was done by scholars either from communication studies or from linguistics or rhetorics and some people from social sciences. So this is what inspired, let's say, in the beginning people at MIT and whatever to produce these machines. And you can also have the same look on, let's say, so-called virtual communities. They were inspired by social science research. So what we have rather is a kind of loop. <laughs> and we are much more involved in this loop uh, than we might think. And exactly this is the reason why, why I think um, that uh, researching only the influence or the effect, this is a misunderstanding. So we forget by this the loop. Uh, and uh, when things come back somehow to us and we say, whoosh, this is not a really, really a community. This is then what academics said to virtual communities. Or uh, this is not really human communication. This is what I said. This is right, yeah? but it's based on our models of. 
and this is a crucial thing. And pioneer communities there are um, somehow an interlink. So these pioneer communities integrate uh, people who come from research, who come from industries, who are everyday users, who ha have a tech writing background and so on. Uh, they are intermediaries in the sense like as Bourdieu framed the, the term originally. And this is the reason why I think, when, why I'm personally move closer and closer into this research on pioneer communities uh, because I think uh, this is an under Mass, an underestimated kind of group. So there's not really a reflection about that group. And now I'm saying a sentence for the people of uh, political economy. The large companies, they start with things when they are quite sure that they can make the money off in three, four, five years. But they don't start with the things. Yeah. Think about, so I see many people here having now smart watches, so think about the Apple Watch, the Google devices and so on. Yeah, well, they did market it, but they did not develop the original technology, they did not develop the imagination, and they did not do somehow the testing. This was much more done in the context of one pioneer community, and this is the quantified self-movement in that context. And this also happens now. Yeah? And I think um, we have really a tendency to look when the things are obvious, yeah? and not to look when the things are emergent. And this is what I at least would like to sensitize more scholars. Of course, two thirds can and should focus on these other questions, but I think it should become a larger group of people who also start to investigate the things because if we want to make a better world, then we really must think about the things when they are coming up and not when the things are there. This is my point I would like to make here, normatively spoken now. Well, I don't have an answer. When I, <laughs> when I would have the answer uh, or the final answer, uh, I would be much more engaged in this. I think UNESCO ongoingly has done a good, good, good work, and I think uh, the European Union, in the meantime, became an important institution when it comes to questions of regulation, and they are also inviting many scholars. So I know colleagues uh, who are involved, also from our networks who are involved uh, in feedback uh, on this. So this is uh, one thing and where we should all work together. I think when it comes to children and in the internet, Sonia Livingston has done terrific work uh, together with the United Nations, uh, so Global Kids Online. So this is, these are things we really need. But there's also another thing where I think which we should stop. <laughs> And this is the romanticizing view on the so-called Silicon Valley. So I don't understand Silicon Valley as just this Bay re Area region around San Francisco where these companies are, but as a narration. Yeah? And we all are involved into this kind of discourse that the next big thing will come from, uh, from Silicon Valley. So I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, and as long as we jointly and ongoingly believe this and keep this discourse going, having this romanticizing view to the Bay Area or to Silicon Valley, uh, it won't stop so fast. And we should think much more radically about alternatives, at least as long as we would like to have a different kind of so-called digital society. So that's it, what I would say. Thanks a lot.